Today's podcast is with a dear friend, Natasha Pelgrim. Natasha leads the wellness retreats at Synthesis Institute and also has her own 5-MeO DMT retreats out of Ibiza uh, entitled Awaken the Medicine Within. Enjoy. Welcome to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, here to bring you cutting-edge interviews with leading scientists, entrepreneurs, and medical professionals who are exploring how we can integrate psychedelics in an intentional and responsible way for both healing and transformation. It is my honor and privilege to bring you these episodes as you get deeper and deeper into why these medicines are so critical to the future of humanity. So let's go and let's see what we can explore and learn together in this incredibly important time. And this podcast is sponsored by Mind Bloom. Legal psychedelic medicine is here and it's available through Mind Bloom. Mind Bloom helps you transform your life with safe, science backed psychedelic therapy. If you're looking for your depression or anxiety breakthrough, Mind Bloom provides a fully guided and clinician monitored experience tailored just for you. Some clients see results as soon as 24 hours after their first session. Mind Bloom is, in fact, our first official partner here at Third Wave and a company and organization that we support. In fact, I'm going to start my own Mind Bloom experience in the coming weeks and will write about my experience going through ketamine therapy to address both cannabis addiction and general anxiety. The cannabis was to cover up the anxiety, and I can't wait to share my own transformation with you. So Third Wave Podcast listeners, you get $50 off your experience today if you use the promo code THIRDWAVEISHERE. Reach your full potential at mindbloom.co. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Apollo Neuro, the first scientifically validated wearable that actively improves your body's resilience to stress. I received my own Apollo Neuro at the beginning of COVID in March, and it saved my life. It was incredible to wear this little device on my ankle that helped me to regulate and stay in a parasympathetic mode. It was unbelievable. In fact, I wrote up a review on Third Wave about how Apollo is like a microdose on your wrist. It was developed by a friend of Third Wave, Dr. Dave Rabin, medical doctor and PhD, a neuroscientist and board-certified psychiatrist who has been studying the impact of chronic stress in humans for nearly 15 years. He is a pioneer in alternative mental health treatments and an active practitioner in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. You see, stress triggers the sympathetic fight-or-flight response of our nervous system, and Apollo activates your parasympathetic rest and digest response to help you bounce back from stress more quickly. It works by engaging with your sense of touch, delivering gentle, soothing vibrations that signal safety to the brain. It's been tested in multiple clinical trials and has proven to improve heart rate variability, the key biometric of stress. Apollo doesn't track your health. It actively improves your health and is safe and effective for adults and children alike. All you need to do to get 15% off your Apollo Neuro device is go to apolloneuro.com backslash third wave. That is apolloneuro.com slash third wave. Wave, and you can get your Apollo Neuro device for 15% off. Special for Third Wave listeners. Hey, listeners, and welcome back to the Third Wave podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin. And today I have a dear friend on the show, Natasha Pelgrim. Natasha and I met through Synthesis back in mid 2018. She had reached out early 2018, and we met for coffee and then, you know, had expressed interest in what we were up to. And we ended up bringing her in for the second cohort of Synthesis Retreats in July 2018. And then from there on out, she's been an integral part of the team at Synthesis. And Natasha also, in addition to leading the wellness retreats at Synthesis, uh, leads her own retreats in Ibiza through a program, Awaken the Medicine Within, where she uses 5-MeO DMT for those retreats. And this podcast, I mean, because we are such close friends, we know each other so well, it was just really, really good to drop in, record an hour, talk about sex, drugs, rock and roll, healing childhood wounds, reconnecting with nature and moving past negative patterns, 
why we have to heal ourselves before we can help others, discovering ways to bring sacredness into everything we do, overcoming resistance, the gift of duality, and living in constant gratitude, as well as so much more. If you're interested in 5-MeO-DMT in particular, there's been a lot of publicity around it, a lot of people who are becoming interested in it. You know, I myself have only done 5-MeO in very small amounts. I still have yet to have sort of the big breakthrough unity consciousness experience. And if you're interested in it, I think you're going to learn a thing or two from Natasha in this episode, especially towards the end of the episode, we get a little bit deeper into what's going on with 5-MeO, what effect it has, why it's becoming so popular. And I also share some of my own hesitations about the increasing popularity of 5-MeO, largely around this sort of guaranteed mystical experience shooting uh, someone into unity consciousness. And while it can be incredibly profound and insightful and awakening, it can also be um, extremely overwhelming and, and potentially traumatic. And so when we look at these plant medicines, we actually talked about this in the Tucker Max episode, which was published a few months ago. We're really looking at, okay, how do we first heal trauma through something like MDMA? Once the trauma is healed, how do we sort of come awake and alive to a new sense of self through LSD and psilocybin? And then once you know that structure and foundation is, is in place, then what medicines like ayahuasca and 5-MeO can open that so-called crown chakra, uh, the connection to divinity, so we can experience everything that life is. Um, anyway, so with Natasha, retreat leader, an incredible healer, um, the space that she holds is phenomenal. Her presence has so much gravitas to it. And, you know, I, I just can't wait for you all to tune in to this episode. So without further ado, I bring you Natasha Pilgrim. We've had so, so many conversations and we finally get to record one. And it's just, it's a real pleasure and honor to, to have you on the podcast. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's so awesome to be here because we did have so many. We shared rooms together. We did. <laughs> we shared dances together on hip hop. <laughs> um, so much. So many learnings. <laughs> and and experiences together. You know, I mean, when we brought you in for synthesis, that was mid twenty eighteen, and and we hosted a couple of retreats together. Uh, the ones that were at that one, I don't remember the name of it, but it was a super cool modern spot. And then we found the lighthouse where Synthesis hosted all of its retreats in 2019 and the beginning of 2020. And I had the opportunity to um, sit in that experience and, and you and Don held space and you did such a phenomenal job. So you're one of the very few people who um, I've had a guided experience with, you know, with, with psilocybin and, and the space that you hold is phenomenal and, and your energy is so goddessy and feminine and big and, and so loving and, and so open and, um, and yeah, so I just want to love on you for, um, I could just love on you this whole podcast. Be, <laughs> yeah. be well worth it. Yeah, we'll so, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, let's, you know, so the audience has a little bit of context. Let's start with you and who you are. And um, maybe about a year ago, you had posted something or less than a year ago on Facebook about your journey into coming into consciousness and, and awakening and how, you know, your background before that was running nightclubs in Amsterdam and, you know, and, and then there was a shift, there was a transition. So I'd love to just hear a little bit about who Natasha was before she was hosting ceremonies and space and, and all this stuff. What 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 was the the pre-awakened Natasha, if you will? Yeah. Where does that start? Um, first of all, thank you so much for you and the work that you do and the team behind you and around you for facilitating so much knowledge in the world. Um, so with the third wave is an important, important, very important platform for many my journey before sitting in ceremony <laughs> um, is indeed, I always say, you know, uh, rock and roll, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and, and you get the picture. <laughs> That's a space of we recognize um, of transition. But, you know, I, it began as a child growing up, um, very sensitive, extra sensory, um, and not fully understanding what this sensitivity me meant. Um, 
and growing up with a family member with an opioid addiction and the complexities around uh, being dependent for your safety on someone that cannot keep themselves safe, right? So, um, and those two combined have always been a big fuel for me to uh, discover and wanting to understand our human needs, our um, what makes us tick, what is it that some are wounded in some way and get um, into addiction and some have other wounds and flourish from it, you know, see it as a growth doesn't mean they don't have challenges. So those questions already came in at a very young age. Uh, so exploring consciousness and exploring healing fields have always been my first psychedelic experience was when I was 15 on mushrooms in Amsterdam. I grew up in Amsterdam and in Portugal and in Spain, but in Amsterdam, um, very recreational. I, back in the days, uh, I'm 41 right now, we had CD shops. So for those of the generation who do not know what CD shops are, it's where you could purchase music and it wasn't for free. <laughs> um, and we had taken mushrooms and, and uh, we went into the shop and um, um, seeing, seeing the music in color and, and shapes was a revelation to me because as a child, I had experienced similar kind of visions without um, plant medicines and um, so there was a a laughter and a aha but only um, recently the biggest gift of that journey I discovered only a few years ago so this was 15 I'm 41 count it you know like so sometimes it takes a long time before recognizing that and because I've always been so interested in people in ecstatic states Drugs was never, you know, like MDMA was my favorite party drug ever. Um, at a certain point, it uh, wasn't just MDMA. I got really a lot into alcohol and cocaine uh, as a party scene and um, had indeed a bar and a nightclub and a restaurant and a, and a um, um, fashion designer clothing store. I was all in one building. And um, at a certain point, I remember standing on my bar with a bottle of champagne in one hand and a bottle of vodka in another hand, and being super popular and praised. And I've got a flash of, holy shit, I'm 30. By the time that was 33, I'm 33. Do I want to stand like this when I hit 40? And it just hit me. I was like, I think I discovered everything I needed to discover from my ego perspective of what I thought success was. Because in the end of the day, I put myself at the age of 29 in a very male-dominated um, environment in the hospitality and, and, and events industry as a very young woman. And in the end of the day, what I wanted was recognition and the love of my father. <laughs> you know, So I put myself a lot into an environment with older men and um, in business. And when that hit me, that specific moment hit me, I was like, I need to get out of here. This is not who I am. I cannot be under the influence of, in, a, in a club and look at somebody and say, hey, your chakras are not really aligned. You have an entity on your back. Shall I help you? While I'm five minutes before, I just snorted a, you know, stuff in my nose, like what the shit, <laughs> right? Like, um, so um, when I had that big epiphany of, of mul- there were multiple things that came in. I mean, I wasn't, you know, in a great relationship. I was losing friendships. Uh, my priorities were not in, in integrity and in, in service. So um, I basically really just sat down. I called up uh, two very famous Dutch um, investors and I said, uh, who wants it? First bid, I'm out. And within six months, I gave in the keys and walked away. And um, yeah, that's that's the start of the process. And this was in 2013. And that's actually the beginning of me choosing a healthier lifestyle, which then went back into um, the healing possibility of plants instead of the recreation and the and the submission or the you know walking away of seeing seeing shadow. Yeah. It's a very individual journey, right? Like we all have the, the the wounds that we grew up with, and the things that result from that, the professions that we pursue, the the dreams that that come from from ego, so to say. The especially the what you said with the male dominated part of that, and it feels like then a huge part of your personal journey has been, okay, I did this thing, 
right? Alcohol, cocaine, hospitality industry, very male dominated. And I'm sure even in that thing, you were very, you, you had a really strong feminine energy and presence, but it was likely conflicted because you felt like a fragment of yourself was off here, but another fragment of yourself really just wanted to be much more nurturing and compassionate and loving and, and kind. So I, I'd love if you could just bring us a little bit deeper into that, because I feel like when we first connected two and a half years ago and I looked on your personal website, that is the thing that stuck out to me was the feminine essence, the sort of goddess archetype, the, 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 the beauty, the, the nurturing, the compassion, the love. Um, how, how has that evolved for you over these last, you know, seven, eight years after you left the hospitality industry? What, what does it mean for you to be a, a woman and, and like really, you know, integrating and, and becoming coherent in that? Yeah, beautiful question. It's, it's, you know, it's still an unfolding because every life st- stage brings a new um, a medicine in it and a new cycle. Um, yes, the, the qualities have always been there. Even, you know, uh, I, be, I, would op- I would do smudging and praying before I would open the club. You know, like those practices and the things that I do today, it wasn't like from one day or another. At 21, I was already Reiki master. You know, I went to a lot of Buddhist retreats and Vipassana, um, a lot of uh, quantum physics practices and teachers. So it's always been a part of that I developed. The, um, that space of the harshness of business uh, was killing the part of me um, and, and also the, um, you know, the, the cash flow industry and people under the influence and people, you know, um, you cannot trust everybody. And that, those parts that really, really hurt in my heart. And when I made that decision to step out of that, I went on a walk of uh, Santiago de Compostela because I'd uh, you know, read the Paulo Coelho book when I was 18. And I was like, that was on my bucket list. I was like, now that's, this is the moment to do it. Go walk for three weeks. Walk it off. Think about what you've done. <laughs> you know, like go, go into that space. And being back in, in nature and in that nature space and literally going to the toilet in nature, you know, like having all your needs there and that connection back remembered our uh, my innate ability as a woman you have in your body the ability to be a doula to be a space holder because this is the space that we and not even a woman as biologically a woman some some people are have more feminine developed n- nurturing qualities it doesn't mean you have to be born as a woman to have this so for the listeners, this is not an exclusion. This is massively an inclusion. Um, but the, that, that ability to really hold that, it, be, it started growing again in this nature walk, in this rite of passage. And I felt that passing each old tree, I would see it as an elder teaching me something new. Every rock that I was climbing, every you know season that I was walking through. And um, those metaphors really brought me back into... Um, the need to sit again and sit in silence and um, the the space of yeah that it, this is definitely a quality of nurturing that I have and there is a quality that I had to develop for myself first it, it wasn't from one day to another where I found the right teachers and they taught me how to work with plant medicines no life taught me very harshly to heal uh, very big wounds of mine first. It took me about two years before I could fully understand and let go the codependencies that I had recreated. You know, I went to AA meetings. Um, I'd broken up with my partner after 10 years. And the medicines helped in that whole process of nurturing. But I never felt the calling of, uh, now I'm going to work uh, with uh, 5-MAO-DMT. And th- that's definitely not how, how it ended up uh, in this journey. But the biggest teaching was really about me first. We have to come into healing with ourselves first before we step into anything else. One thing that you mentioned there was cultivating stillness, right? So to go from the hospitality industry, owning a nightclub, alcohol, cocaine, so much of that is external. So much of that is out in the world. And what 
so many of us learn from plant medicines is the value of stillness and the richness of stillness and how many of the answers that we see can be found in stillness. More people are like waking up to that in a way. There's a great book that I've read called The Listening Society, which talks about how the big sort of task, if you will, of of culture, society, uh, individuals in culture and society is to learn how to listen, is to learn how to cultivate stillness, is to learn how to sort of hold that space and just allow whatever to emerge, to emerge, emerge. And, and one thing you had mentioned at the beginning of the podcast is how you, you're very sensitive, you know, and how you have this sort of extrasensory sense and stillness, cultivating stillness helps to also cultivate that really, really strong intuition. Um, so when it comes to like the, the intuition that you're developing and the, the intuition that you've developed, how did your intuition guide you? You know, so you're on Santiago de Compostela, you're walking, you're, you're, you're understanding the value of stillness. You're probably tapping more and more into that, that sense of inner knowing. Where does that lead you in the next five, six, seven years? And, and, and maybe why in particular did you choose to work with, with these medicines in such a profound and, and impactful way? Yeah. Very good question and, and big, big question too. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Take um, as long as you want. <laughs> we are in a um, rush. Yeah. So, so indeed that stillness, because the, the one, the one message I received is, um, okay, now just sit with your shit, <laughs> you know? So in that transition, it was really back to meditation, back to the practice, back to, um, and all of these practices, um, and the remembering and reusing it, because sometimes we have phases where we lose a certain practice, you know? There's some techniques that we even forget, oh yeah, I used to do this, you know, and you relive it. And um, and that, that whole journey, um, it took me about, I think, if I look at time frames, because that's always tricky. I think it took about the first two years, so 2013, 14, halfway 15. I remember I felt that I was breathing fresh air again. You know, like I had a certain healing path with myself. I even had a, a very simple job. You know, I like I had run two businesses at by by that time, and. I decided to actually work in a call center. And yes, I know. Wait. <laughs> I know. What? So this is not sex calls, Paul. <laughs> These were <Like>. reservations. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, because the thing was, I did not want any responsibility. Yes, I could lead a team. Yes, I could look at spreadsheet and be, you know, like I could do business and all of that. But it's like, I need to redefine my purpose here. I need some space and time. I had a really I had massive debt because I didn't step out with a big chunk of money and said like, okay, I'm going to sell it for this much. Actually, I did a really bad business deal and I had to do some healing on that perception that I was not a good business person too, but that's a different story. Um, yeah, so I had I actually went into this very simple job where uh, four days a week I was for eight, nine hours at a call center doing holding reservations. And I figured how can I, bring in sacredness in everything that I do. And I started practicing to speak from the heart, to drop into my chest because people were calling and it was an opportunity with the frequency of my voice to change awareness or to bring awareness or for me to be in awareness, not even for the other, but it was really for me. So how could I bring from sitting in practice to a very mundane activity and day-to-day activity, which was survival mode, um, and bring that sacredness in. And I would never forget colleagues at that time, I would walk into that office and at a certain point after a few months, people would say like, what do you do? You always come in so gracefully and and silent. And, And I was like, really? Oh, I feel like shit. Because I would wake up, be crying, be on my bike to the office, wipe it off, do my thing and go crying and go to bed. You know, like I was like, Oh, it's somewhere it's you're radiating something. Um, but internally I had to do a lot of healing and, um, but then fast forward, uh, very quickly, you know, I've always been in a a trainer. I've always been a coach. I've always educated myself in that way. And it went very gradually and organically. I started coaching people and I started a practice. I started, 
organizing meditation circles in my living room until it got too big. So I had to rent a place and uh, developed a workshop program of one day and then it became three days. And, and as I was doing all of this, um, uh, I rediscovered plant medicines in a in a different in a different way, and um, my first journey back into uh, the healing of it instead of recreational uh, space of it was with ayahuasca. That was a very profound experience. I didn't receive a message you're going to work with us, you know, like at all. No, it was a very profound message of letting go and forgiving myself, mostly more than anything. And then I had a, a partner at a time who had done 5-MAO with a beautiful female facilitator. And he said, Natasha, this is for you. And I was like, hell no. This is, I started reading the third wave on the explanation of what 5-MAO was. <laughs> I was like, hell no, that's not for me. I'm, I'm all, you know, like I was saying, I'm all about gentleness. I believe in the invitation and the, and the body, the innate ability to heal itself when you create the right conditions. This is, this is not for me. And I started saying, no, no, no. Until my nose became um, very, um, um, very resistant. You know, you have nose that you know are intuitive, are more silent. And you have nose where there is resistance. And I went like, hmm. If it's one thing I've learned from transformation, it's when this kind of resistance shows up, shit, I have to do it now. You know, like I have to, I have to visit this invitation that has been sent to me now multiple times. I found a beautiful uh, healer uh, with the medicines that had cured him, uh, that was cured through uh, an opioid addiction through 5-MeO. And uh, we started calling and, you know, like two months we had phone calls and we're connecting and then. He said to me, hey, Natasha, I'm willing to come to the Netherlands. Um, if you know a few people, then, you know, maybe it makes it worthwhile than just being you because that might be a bit expensive. It's like, okay, I'll just ask around. And by that time, I already had a good client base of international coaching clients and uh, many different backgrounds. So I put it, a few out there that I knew that were open to it. And before I knew it, I had like 20 people that were interested. And I was like, oh, that's odd. Really? <laughs> um, I was like, okay. So I said to uh, my teacher, uh, I said, I'm going to give him credits, Enrique, Kike, if you're listening, I love you. <laughs> and um, he taught me so much. So, and, and he came to Holland and, um, and I was like, okay, let me just be here because these are the people that I know and I love and, and I'm, you know, I support their, their process. So let me stay here for the weekend. And I hadn't done 5-MEO, so I went first before uh, the, the guests arrived. And I remember him giving me um, the toad. At the time, we, we worked with a toad, and I can go a bit into um, the toad and synthetic 5-MEO. But um, at the time, we worked with the, with the toad, and I received it. And I was present. I was there, and I remember... <laughs> yelling out loud i think mdma is more for me <laughs> so uh, that was my first reaction <laughs> and then he went like okay maybe you need a little, a little bit of resistance <laughs> a little, <laughs> a little resistance. resistance there <laughs> exactly yeah. um then he went like i think you need a higher dose you want to go again it's like yeah that's fine let's go again and i stayed quite present and uh, i was like okay that's good went a third time stayed quite present and i know i was like you know what it's good let's 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 start doing the people after the weekend i'll do my another round it's fine and i felt sensations in the body but it wasn't the the big aha which i had heard that you could you know i wasn't i wasn't impressed <laughs> let's say let's give it to that um and then a the weekend had gone it was amazing to witness it was amazing because I stepped in the first person that went with Enrique and me assisting. I stepped into that space intuitively and everything I had experienced, everything I had learned, everything that was in my ancestral line came online and I knew what to do. And I, there was such a big remembering and I had come home. I'm like, oh my God, this is what I've been preparing for my whole life. This is a space. <gasps> and I didn't even have that big wow, aha moment myself, but I knew, whoa, this is such a gift. You know, like 
So I was in the clouds only from that realization and witnessing other people's journey. By the end of the weekend, I'll share this bit, is um, I did my session. And then Enrique says, sister, sister, you want initiation dose? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever, give me whatever that means. I don't know what that means. Sure, give me initiation dose. Which meant it was mixed uh, bufo, which I do not recommend anybody doing. (laughs) Uh, The toad with uh, synthetic, uh, we had a big dose, massive dose mix. And, um, And that's where my release happened. And... That's where I really fully understood, um, yeah, the, 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 the meaning and the gift of duality, of without cold, we cannot perceive warmth. And, and if we are, when we are ju- not just in consciousness, but we're, when we're molded in consciousness, there is not that contrast. Everything is. And I had a reawakening of appreciation of all the pain and all the struggle and that had brought me to that specific moment to receive the gift of the elements and the contrast and um, the gratitude for life, existence. I I was from that moment on, there was something like, um, a, a deep gratitude for being here. And it doesn't mean I don't have challenging days and I'm not triggered in my relationship. Believe me, I'm, you know, we're all, really all human. But there is an underlying understanding of massive trust and faith that, um, that has changed forever since that moment. So, yeah, that's been the journey so far a bit. <laughs> I did some psychedelics last night. I'm not going to say what and I'm not going to say where because that, that <laughs> I see, but I was with I was with probably one of my closest male mentors who I've also had on the podcast before, and he had um, he used to play with the Santo Daime for many 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 years with the, the 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 two founders out in Oregon and was the guitar player and sat in hundreds of ceremonies and we were talking about this last night and he's like yeah like when you're in it like w- when you're in ayahuasca and you're like purging and you you know there's all this sort of disgusting stuff coming up and you're like really really in it. When you've done this sort of work enough, you kind of have that 10% awareness on I'm in it, but I'm not. Like you can kind of look like like you can kind of look up and wink across the room, or you kind of look up and smile a little bit and then just go back into like the pain and the grief and whatever the suffering is. Mm. And it feels like a five MEO experience or any sort of mystical experience that we have with psychedelics, it's that like nice 10% of trust and faith when even things like COVID happen or even triggers come up in a relationship or we're sort of in the midst of a a difficult kind of work, whatever, and we're stressed, there's that 10% of knowing "Eh, this this will pass too. So there's, there's an ability to observe the suffering, but not get too caught up in it. And and it feels like that that's exactly what you're speaking about with the five MEO and grounding in that. It's like, we, we have these experiences, we know this sort of fundamental truth, and we obviously go back into duality, we go back into existence, and the work continues to be letting go more and more and more and more and more. And you and I are probably aligned in that we don't just want to f- sort of ascend into enlightenment and, and just like evacuate earth, if you will. There's, there's, there's a real calling to, to be in it you know, and to, to sit with people and to hold space for people and to help people feel that way as well. And, and, and that's what you've done such a phenomenal job of. And I, I'd love if we could, I don't know if we'll get into psilocybin so much. I'd, I think there's more here with 5-MeO that I'd love to dive into in the container that you created with, with Awaken the Medicine Within. So you, you meet with Kike, you have this initiation dose, you let go, you release, there's trust and there's faith and, you know, these, the sort of unity consciousness, where does then your own sort of retreats come into play? And, and, and more specifically, what container did you choose to create with those retreats so that people could have this beautiful experience with the toad or synthetic, uh, you know, with five in general? What I love about what you just said is the fact that, you know, it's, it's really not about going anywhere else, but accepting where we are right now. So I just want to pinpoint that a lot of the times clients, you know, I've had been able to hold, I'll answer your question, but it just triggered a thought and I've been able to hold um, 
space for clients and one is I really want to honor um, because recently I received some news as a gentleman <clears throat> Which I'm going to not going to go too much into identity to keep uh, you know confidentiality in place, but he was diagnosed with a form of cancer, and really came in not I'm fully understanding that you know the the five MAO would not heal. Uh, we don't not ever ever make those claims, but he really wanted to understand what was going on and come to come to terms with it. And he, these were not really his words and come to terms with death, but he wanted to understand what he needed to heal, how to grab most out of life. And although, um, so he, he came to me, we did a private session with him and his partner. And the, the, there was a part of him that didn't want to be in, in his suffering, you know, which if you're diagnosed with cancer, of course you don't want to be there. But even the medicines there invited him to be with it, to sit with it, and to give him a really hard teaching um, of, of his own pain and his massive fear of death. Um, and that was intense as a space holder to, to um, witness. And I, I always stress that um, as a space holder, you know, you're really there to create a container of safety in all dimensions of the human being and, and holistic as possible. So you need to understand what it means energetically with one form of a practice, you know, with one form of a tradition, um, but also what it means for the body, what are the consequences for the body, all of that. So that those containers are important. And in, and in, that, in that session... I realized the invitation and the gift he had given me is to look at death myself and create a relationship with it. So to answer your question and to loop this story in, the journey um, going on with uh, Enrique, we traveled and most of our clients were actually people, and this is interesting what life gives you, people with opioid addictions. So I got trained with him with heroin, cocaine, alcohol, um, cigarettes, um, a lot of meals. So one meal after another, I saw the projection of, you know, my, my relationships, my uh, upbringing, my, I was he another way of healing. And they were giving me as much healing because it's a, it's almost like a communion, the facilitator and the person that goes on a journey. You're making a little contract for an X amount of time where you both say, okay, we're willing to go as deep as possible. And I'm there to help you invite to go even deeper than what you think you can do. But I need to have that trust and that faith and that ability to invite you to go into that space in the first place. So when, and on this path, and then after a few years, I started receiving uh, people that messages from, hey, I hear you work with this. It's like, oh, Enrique is not around right now, you know, can do it another time. It's like, no, I want to do it with you. And again, I'm stubborn <laughs> and resistant. And I said, no, and no, and no, until I said to Enrique, yeah, what do you think, people? Do you think I'm ready? I don't think I'm ready. Who am I to do that? And I literally said this. And he was like, hell no, you're all, you know, go for it. Now, like he really supported my growth and supported and trusted the medicine. He really showed me how it is to trust the medicine and when people ring at your door to ask you for it literally that's like it's like spirits telling you you know like listen do 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 what you're meant to be doing here um and we've supported each other since since then uh, always so this is how how that started and then one of the things that I was missing a lot in this space, and this is not to uh, say anything better or worse about anybody, is what I was missing at a time, and this is about four years ago. In, the word integration is now very much up in the air, but about four years ago, it really wasn't. You know, the word integration was like, yeah, we heard of it, probably maps had some info about it, but it wasn't, you didn't have massive integration circles out and... So one of the things I started focusing on is because I came from a coaching background and understood about values and limiting belief work and uh, with neuro-linguistic programming, how to work through these, modali th these things with different modalities, I started implementing preparations and integrations. So I started creating a package that it wasn't about a one second fix of coming half a day with a 5-MEO session and then going out. No, it was a full thing. And 
And people didn't understand. I really had to explain the why because there were so many other facilitators that weren't doing it. So people think, oh, you just want to earn more money. And, you know, like, hell no, you know, like <laughs> that was, that's never been, you know, the, the case. So this is how Awaken actually started growing because of the experience in itself is short in Earth minutes, but the amount you can take out of the experience in an extended amount of time with multiple ceremonies in in a container where you're not distracted, you know, that's what any retreat, if you're going to Vipassana, any retreat, silent retreat, that container is healing in itself. You know, that intention is healing in itself. The morning practice, the food, we have a chef. She is a medicine woman, shaman with food. If, like, I'm not exaggerating. She heals people through food. So all of those elements, I started seeing the importance of it instead of doing this one day quick fix experience. And I started shifting that because I saw the safety it gives to people in terms of how much you can grab out of it and how much learnings you can grab out in that reflection uh, space. And there is another thing. We are live in a society where everything is on demand and everything is quick. Porn is quick. Sex is quick. A date is quick. Food is quick. Everything is quick. So plant medicines and these teachings uh, around the traditional wisdoms are the last thing they are is quick. <laughs> so yeah because plant intelligence yes is not quick right plant intelligence has sort of a it, it's not dopamine driven if you will it's not like the here and now it has kind of a winding path if you will in terms of how it moves through us yeah absolutely and and um the the, the teachings that i receive from the um native american tribe called the hopi uh, tribe and grandmother medicine song who's my teacher my elder for many years and just to um, be clear they do not work with psychedelic plants uh, their most sacred plant is tobacco um so um yeah but my my teachings in in the in this shamanic healing modality and the practice that have been brought in you do you know you have one theme that you work on a whole year. That's a whole day. You work with the cycles. You work with the moons. You work with the seasons. And that asks for a, 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 a different type of commitment, um, which isn't a year. This, it's a lifelong commitment almost. Um, and this is also really what I'm inviting people in, in that commitment to themselves in a format of a five-day that it's not just about those five days, but what are you committing to from here on, right? What, what are you honoring? And it isn't about a specific tradition that you need to honor. Go back to your own roots. You know, what are the plants living in around your house? Honor them, you know, like it's not, it's not that far, far-fetched and it's not that, that woo-woo-wa-wa, you know, like a lot of people make out. It's just actually pretty common, common sense, you know? It's things we already have in our home and, our, and we already have in our ancestral line. And it's just touching back into that, that which yeah. we already know. Yeah, exactly. And educating. So what I always try to do, yes, I, I want to keep people safe on all levels. That means also energetically. I do not have to explain every single detail that I do to prepare for um, a retreat energetically and who I call in. And I mean, I have people that are psychic. I have people that are pranic healing, vortex healing. And before even we go into the retreat place, that place is heat cleared on all levels because together we see more. So even before guests come in, I make sure that that space is as clean and in a vortex where it really serves each and every one in that space. Uh, do I have to tell each participant every time what we do? Oh, why? Maybe they're not there. But it is important to share some of it in the language and meet the participants where they're at with that language. So this is where bridging into neuroscience and a bit of scientific proof of what happens is always good. And again, a third third wave website. <laughs> it helps to ground it. And and that's what we did even with with synthesis is we're like, you know, what's the yeah. what's the synthesis? What's the synthesis of these holistic practices, these um, these rituals, these traditions that we've been using for thousands and thousands of years, and what's the more sort of scientific, grounded, 
this is what has been proven with evidence that people can trust. It was so interesting. I don't know if you remember this. Um, you know, I, I wasn't involved. So obviously I wasn't involved uh, in 2019 as much, but in 2018, I remember as, as these first participants were coming in, they were like, oh, we thought synthesis was going to be this one thing because of the website and the language. And because the, the public messaging was very professional, very scientific, and it still is, you know, very medical, very legally supervised, whatever it is. But we get here, we got Natasha burning sage and we got Don talking about prayers and Buddhism and like, you know, <laughs> Sven who's, who's do, you know, giving everyone hugs and, you know, we're dancing <laughs> after the ceremony. They're like, this is not, not what we expected. And, and that is part, like you were saying, that's part of the container. That's part of the space, right? It's like the mind, so to say, which is how most people in our world make decisions, need certain things to believe and validate itself to trust and go in. But when you're in the container and in the space, it's really about bringing out the heart and bringing about the intu intuition because so much of the healing with this medicine is about connection, connection with oneself, connection with people at the retreat, connection with the divine as, as that comes. And that it feels like that's what you're talking about with there's a, there's a bit of mystery in that container because in the mystery is where the the really interesting little insights and, and other things kind of come to fruition. I totally agree. And, and there's so much to be said about communication on, <laughs> but it almost, it, you know, I love, uh, I bless Michael Pollan for writing the book that he did because 90% of the people <laughs> that come to us read that book that wouldn't a year before it wouldn't have thought that we're going to do something like this. That's a massive, you know, when you have people speaking up this way and, and really going out of their comfort and, 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 um, with, so much scrutiny maybe uh, on the around the corner for doing that so you know praise those that that voice up um i always also find it important to, to name that there is so much out there about healing depression and ptsd and even the 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 research on 5mao that's becoming more and more um you know that's all amazing i am so grateful for people to step up and do this however the trick is when you are have a certain diagnose, right, and you have this hope that this is your fix, it takes a very long commitment. You know, even at Imperial College, the studies have shown that it wasn't just one ceremony. People need multiple ceremonies. People need a community that holds it all together with integration for maybe months, maybe a year. And uh, I'm really hoping that this data is going to come out also more to give a bit of a different voice to it, that the expectation, once you have a certain diagnose, that, you know, oh, this is it. Because imagine if they fall back. Imagine if, if the, you know, the feelings come back after two or three months, what that does like, oh, I'm really not curable. How devastating that is. The implications for the psyche in that way. And how even without a diagnosis, the expectations that people come into retreats of um, I'm stuck on, you know, like the healthy normals. For example, I have a certain success. I have a certain um, accomplishment. I have a family. You know, why am I not fulfilled? They read up on all of it and come in and said, yeah, but I ordered a mystical experience because the research said this and this. The amount of times I've experienced that and, you know, I go like, I just want to give them a big hug and say like, well, you know, yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm going to give you that. And I get uh, it. Sorry. <laughs> like, people get it mentally, of course, but still there is this very high expectation. Okay, this is going to be it. And then they're exposed to a psychic surgery or uh, a lot of visuals and sacred geometry. And they discard those experiences as it as like, no, because I read this is what it makes it because research has shown X, Y, Z about this experience. Well, the sacred geometry has been holy experiences for me. So, uh, you know, like the, um, and, and that, that's where people really need that education of, uh, of what, what that is. And it's a lifelong commitment. And especially with 5-MeO, it's very interesting because the, ex I mean, with psilocybin, of course, it's, you know, four to six hours, the experience, and it's you in a kind of dialogue for those that do not know, kind of dialogue where you, um, you are with the plant, you're in communion, you're in dialogue with the plant. Now with 5-MAO, I, I say there is no language. 
you are, I always say, you're being picked up and dropped in the soup of consciousness, <laughs> you know, like that. And then, you know, like in Earth minutes, it can take 20 minutes. On average, what I've seen in my own experience is about 40 minutes, but that's mostly because there aren't a lot of people, people can really stay in silence. I don't have really, a song is only there if it serves a healing, but after the integration, I'm very focused or on, on um, Tibetan bowls or just silenced. Most of the time is actually more silence. Um, so yeah, so this this healing space and and yeah, coming into to the to the practices in in this way and fully understanding that five meo brings you into that that quickly. And then what happens is afterwards, right? So um, I always I give the analogy of um, I think it's an English accordion, the instrument, right, where you stretch out and it brings it all together. So imagine you're an accordion. You're all about frequency and vibration, and those those uh, uh, curves of the accordion where the where the different sounds are being made. That's the experiences of your life, the challenges, the gifts, all of that. Now five meo. For example, stretches that accordion out, <laughs> right? In one go, it makes one sound bruh, <laughs> like that. So imagine that. Now, in the three, six months to a year, the accordion will come back together and then we fold it out and there's new folds. And that's the experience with the difference between the integration process with 5-MEO and the understanding of the gifts. That's why it's so important to have contemplative practices before to really have that self-awareness to go deeper in, inside. Because it really happens afterwards. I have clients that come back not because they have to, or I created a program that they have to, but their clients, they come back after a year and then they go like, I only now understand. Or even in my own experience, after three months, more or less, I had a few triggers coming up within relationships where I went like, I thought I worked around this, but apparently I didn't. And, and it just had to work a little bit deeper. And my awareness shifted, my intuition shifted in a deeper way, in a deeper knowing. I was like, oh, this was the medicine. And then I started putting in my integration documents how important it is to not do any medicines at least three months after, to really understand what it is that it's been giving to you, which is your ability to heal yourself, you know, and um, to give you that understanding. Um, of course, this is not for everybody. There are many people that have many more different, so I'm generalizing here a bit, but yeah. First of all, thank you. Thank you for all of that, because I think that provides a really rich context of 5-MEO. And like I said before, we started recording the podcast. We haven't had anyone actually on the podcast to talk about this. And and 5-MEO is becoming very popular to, to some degree. You know, like I have several friends now who do 5-MEO ceremonies. There's some really interesting people doing things with 5-MEO in terms of uh, the devices that they're inventing to basically have a guaranteed experience in terms of the delivery mechanism, the amount that they're doing and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I was at a party, not really a party, but a small get together the other night speaking with someone uh, here in Miami about, about 5MEO. And, you know, there's this facilitator who's out in Malibu, who's doing 5MEO and, you know, and it's sort of like a factory in a way where people are now just getting as many, many folks as possible in, to the 5MEO experience and then just sort of releasing them afterwards, you know, not really providing any prep, not really providing any integration, just saying, oh, the medicine will heal you. It'll shoot you into unity consciousness without the recognition that uh, a lot of people aren't ready for that. And and like it actually could be incredibly unhinging and, and psychically traumatizing to just jump into that without any sort of framework or anything. So I'd love if you know, you could just fill our listeners in a little bit with like, from your experience, from what you know about five, like, what are some of the risks? What are some of the concerns? What are some of the things that people should be mindful of? You know, if they've heard a friend or two who's had this beautiful unity consciousness experience, and all of a sudden, you know, they're interested in it, like, well, yeah, what do people need to sort of be mindful of if they're, they're looking to have an, an experience like this? You know, one of the most important things is always why do you want it is because, you know, it's hip and happening and your surroundings are doing it. You know, really question yourself on the why. 
educate yourself on what are the consequences of any of the plants and psychedelics, what are the consequences, read up. Then if you are forwarded to a facilitator, um, uh, you know, ask questions. Ask a lot, a lot, a lot of questions. Are they willing, you know, how, what will they do um, if you suddenly stop breathing? Do they have a first aid? Uh, thus is someone there with an actual first aid training. Uh, James Oreck, who's now uh, recently passed away, bless him, bless him, because the, you know, his books, uh, his book was amazing, was a Bible to me. <laughs> so it's so important. And one of the things that I want to give him credit for and really taught me a lot was like, as a facilitator, your best thing you would be is actually a nurse. <laughs> you know, get all the paraphernalia out of the way, all of the so-called shamanistic tools uh, and whatever you think should be done and educate yourself and be, be a nurse would be the best thing <laughs> with five. And, you know, there is a part of me that fully agrees and there's a part of me that understands, uh, you know, certain shamanic tools and what it is to fully, you know, work with people with soul loss and, and cord cutting and entities and all, you know, like that whole shebang and what, what that is and also that importance and what that influences our psyche as much as the therapeutic background. And this is why I love the therapeutic background to come in is the oath they take is do no harm. And this is where facilitators are... Um, you know, um, can can buy, purchase the medicine online. You know, it should be accessible. It shouldn't be the chosen few. But there isn't a container where people are educated or they can go to to learn how to work with it. And there are even people out there now that have worked with it are educating others without that container. And uh, so the the you know there is mo the most the biggest risk is. Um, um, of course, if you have in your family um, cis schizophrenia, any diagnose of you know bipolar is a very big risk. But also, um, uh, depression can be a risk. Are you willing to um, to maybe have a fallback? And how do you hold yourself in that? Are you taking any form of medications, um, antidepressants, um, SSRIs, etc.? But also the heart cardiovascular that's very very important um, and then there is a difference between 5-MAO synthetic and, and the toad and um, synthetic is a lot cleaner and a lot you know lesser risk for the body I have to be honest you know there is um, there is some say that a, there is a difference between uh, because of the toad has bufotenin in there and other compounds which is also a psychoactive and synthetic is you know very just synthetic 5-MeO and 5 you know like I don't know if there is a difference that's I have to be honest I really don't because I thought I knew I've walked around for years saying there was so <laughs> I also had to learn and then I realized being in that space myself multiple times that I had an aha moment well I'm like who's to say that I think if something is organic is better I mean, the whole term, the God molecule, is something, everything is a God molecule. Why, n n hello? <laughs> everything is a God molecule, right? So if everything is part of life, then a synthetic is also part of life. So, you know, I went like that deep philosophical. So I'm, I'm, I don't have an answer, but um, I'm seeing less and less of people having massive differences in experience. Um, and I only work with synthetic right now because of the toads and, and the way, um, yeah, the secretion and, and things that are happening right now there that I don't want to dive too deep into because there's also confidentiality in there. But yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not pretty and it's not sustainable. Mm. 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 And so better to, to go with the synthetic and, that, and that's where more and more people are. Gearing, in fact, um, USONA, who hopefully our listeners are familiar with, a nonprofit based out of Wisconsin. They and and I'll just quick mention about synthesis. Synthesis is rolling out this practitioner training that USONA is partnering with, yes. which is phenomenal. And USONA just published the synthesis for five MEO DMT. 
I think that came out last week or a couple of weeks ago. And so they've now made that publicly available. And that's what I love so much about the nonprofits in the psychedelic space, especially USONA. It was so funny when, when Compass Pathways went public back in September, the very same day that Compass Pathways went public, USONA published the public synthesis for psilocybin, which is phenomenal. And then 5-MeO-DMT, yeah. same thing. So... Synthesis, natural. I have friends, you know, I have a friend who goes down to the desert every year and has a relationship in the Sonoran Desert and, and collects, you know, toad secretions for his clients. Most of the people that I know work with synthetic. I personally have only had a very sort of baby experience with 5-MeO. I would call it a little bit more than a microdose, but definitely not the full thing. And I've sort of been waiting to sit with Natasha. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, COVID kind of put a kink in that, but patience is... Is sort of the, the the game with this. So, um, any any last sort of tidbits or last little things before we we're, we're reaching about the hour mark? But before we wrap up the podcast, anything else that's kind of come in? Because we could keep talking. I'm like this. Uh, we could probably go another hour uh, with this this thing. But um, any yeah, yeah. I definitely have just um, one thing that I would love because you named about the practitioner training and. Um, you know, so many people are f- hearing a calling or even having the ambition. And I don't mean ambition as a dirty word because we've been taught that ambition is a dirty thing to have. Uh, like the same thing as leadership. We have to reclaim certain words again. Um, but have the ambition or the calling to uh, work with um synthetic or plants or psilocybin and so many things are happening in the u.s right now around this so it's so amazing and uh, i've been approached a lot like how you know how where did you learn how did you learn how to and i just don't want to you know have to sit with a lot of your own experiences if it's one takeaway find people that are so much wiser than you in this space that have have maybe a few decades of experience and be a beginner and sit in that space and have a lot of medicine journeys because there's so many people uh, how beautiful and they're well intentioned with one journey you know um stepping into holding space with for someone else you're putting a whole community at risk, not only the person and yourself, but if something goes wrong, the impact on a world and how quickly news travels is massively, it can stop all the work that we've been doing right now in this way. So just bringing that responsibility that you're part of a community, you're part of something that can really support people and we're really building this new paradigm. So... Take that responsibility for yourself, for the ones that you're sitting with. And if you're stepping into this community, then this is your responsibility. So just bringing that voice, a bit of reason in, because this is what's given to me by others when, when I was a baby <laughs> and still am. You know? That's great advice. It's, yeah. it's really, really great advice. So as a, as a final thing, Natasha, if, if listeners want to find out more about your work, Obviously, with, with COVID happening right now, retreats aren't going on. But where, you know, do you have a website? Is there, where, where can people find out more about what you're up to? Yes. So the website for the Awaken the Medicine Within is really awakenthemedicinewithin.com for, the, uh, for those retreats. And uh, of course, right now we're not holding retreats. And I hold only retreats with 5-MeO in countries where it's decriminalized in a private setting in Europe. Um, so just to clarify, also, I do not sell the medicine. <laughs> Don't, do not contact me on Instagram. <laughs> um, so just putting that out there as well. Um, and then, of course, my, my website, natashapelgom.com, uh, my beautiful Dutch name. Um, and uh, yeah, for people to inform, I always do, you know, a pre-discovery uh, call with people just to get to know each other before you have to commit to anything. And I don't know where COVID is going, but as it looks right now, we have full lockdown again in the Netherlands. So um, it will probably be somewhere I, um, 2021, um, I hope, I really, really hope spring. So um, then we're opening up business again. Yeah. Great. Thank well, you. Natasha, thank you. Thank you for for popping on. Thank you for reaching out when you did two and a half years ago, and and meeting for coffee at what hotel was that? The um, Volks Hotel. Where do you, 
the Volks Hotel, which is a cool hotel in, in Amsterdam. And thank you for the space that you've held and the, the healing that you've helped people through and everything that you know, you've done with Awaken the Medicine and also obviously with, with Synthesis. It really, there's there's so much more that, that, that we will talk about, but we'll have to save it for another time. So uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's late there as well. It's like 9 p.m. So yeah, just thank you. Thank you.